Okay. Alrighty, I think we are good. Now, uh, is Gabby here? Yep, cool. Do you want to do the, do you want to do the Bible reading from the castle? Yeah, all right, cool. Can you see over? Yeah, yeah, there you go. All right. Okay, this is Gabby, and Gabby is going to do our reading from this morning. I don't know if you can see her from over there, but um, there she is. Okay. Genesis 1, 8 to... Genesis 4, 8 to 17. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground which, ha- which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless warner of the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be, f- hid- and I will be hidden from your pre- presence. Sorry. <laughs> I will be restless wanderer of the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, Not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain made love to his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city, and he named it after his son, Enoch. Thanks, Gabby. This is the word of the Lord. And so this, if you hadn't worked out, was the city that Cain built. (laughs) We'll come back to that. I want to tell a little story to begin with uh, uh, in relation to the story of Cain and Abel. Um, This is from uh, Pete Gregg's uh, most recent book, How to Hear God. Anyone read that that book yet? Or you you may have read Pete Gregg's um, How to Pray. Great books. Um, So Pete tells this story uh, of uh, when he brought a friend of his to church. And this friend was, uh, he'd had a drug problem for a long time. He was a bit of a junkie. And so it took a fair bit of time to get to the point where his friend agreed that he would come along with him to a church and uh, they, they went to a church nearby in his area and Pete was just praying and hoping that the service that day would be something that would encourage this guy, this friend of his, this junkie to, to explore faith in Jesus and that it would be, you know, wouldn't be weird with a whole heap of Christianese and just put him off forever. And anyway, so they went to this church and uh, it was a bit. It wasn't great to start with. Things were a bit weird. It was a bit kind of. You know, it, it didn't. It was not really gelling. This guy was joining in with the women's parts of the songs when you know all this kind of thing. It just seemed to be making fun of it. And it oh, doesn't matter though. What really matters is the message. I just hope and pray that the message will connect with this guy and he'll be able to say those words that we all hope that. Someone who, who, who's, who's, who's we're trying to bring to faith would say, oh, it was just like it spoke directly to me. So he was hoping for this and praying for this. Anyway, the guy who's going to do the sermon gets up on the stage and Pete says all he remembers about him was he was this kind of lanky guy with a big Adam's apple. And whenever he spoke, the Adam's apple kind of went up and down like this. And, and this guy said, the, the sermon today is going to be on Cain and Abel. And Pete's heart sunk a little bit, knowing this strange story which literally ends with, and then he went to live in the land of Nod, you know, and, and, and it's about him killing his brother and it's just kind of, oh, my goodness. And the sermon goes on and Pete's thinking, this, this guy is just, this is just, he's just going to be tuning out. I've ruined it. He's not going to connect at all. This is the end. He's never going to want to come to church ever again. Anyway, they're ch- chatting after the service and Pete says to his friend sheepishly, he's like, how did, so what did, what did you think? And his friend of his says, oh, it was amazing, man. So good. Oh, that's, that's really interesting. What, what, did you, 
just, just out of interest, I mean, I know it was amazing, but what particularly did you find amazing about that service? Oh, the message, man. It, it was like the guy was speaking just to me. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, just out of interest, what, what particular part of the message resonated just with you? Well, he just kept saying it over and over and over. It's caned and able. Caned and able. I mean, it's like either you're caned or you're able. Uh, I've just been getting caned all my life. I've been doing drugs and sleeping with all these women, but I need to be able, man. It's like God was speaking just to me. Anyway, that has nothing to do with the message today (laughs) other than to say, if we open our hearts, God can speak to us however he may want to speak to us, no matter what we hear. So, Father... Whatever comes out of my mouth this morning and whatever comes into our ears this morning, we pray that you would speak to us and that you would open our hearts to hear what you would want to say just to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Alrighty, now on to the real message. So, uh, we're in a series called Ways in the Wilderness and uh, uh, one of the things about this this, series theme of the wilderness in the scriptures is that it's, it's a scary place. The wilderness is a, um, uh, one, one person described it as a land that lacks everything. It's not a nice, serene place. It's actually a dangerous place with threats and fears and all sorts of things that um, uh, uh, a dryness and a lack of water and a lack of resource and a lack of people, which make it, um, uh, one author says, without God, wildernesses, both literal and figurative, are terrible places. However, with God, they become tools in our Saviour's hands, schools of spiritual growth. Tools in our Saviour's hands, schools of spiritual growth. Um, Jesus refers uh, in his testing in the wilderness to Deuteronomy chapter 8. And he says, uh, and that passage says that the wilderness, the purpose of it, God taking his people into the wilderness was humbling, teaching and testing. Humbling us, teaching us and testing us. Not like kind of school test where you're trying to get the answers right, but kind of that testing of, that litmus testing of where are you at? Where, how strong is that faith really? Um, I said last week in, in talking about Jesus' experience in the wilderness that he refers to this. This is what the, the wilderness is about, but also that his experience points out to us and shows us that our deepest desire is really not to achieve something or become something, but the deepest desire in our heart, in our life, is to hear these words from our Heavenly Father, you are loved, you are my beloved. That's really what deep down we long for. Um, And finally, that in the wilderness, Jesus did what you and I can't and couldn't do. And that is that he, he went through it, not giving in to the temptation, not succumbing to the testing uh, before him, but actually coming through, um, trusting in God the whole way. And we just, we just get that wrong. And so clinging to Jesus when we're in our wilderness is the thing that we ought to do. So that's a short recap of last week. Um, this series is called Ways in the Wilderness because there are lots of ways that God works in the wilderness to grow us and to shape us. And there'll be many of those that we'll see in the coming weeks as we look at different characters and their experience in the wilderness in the scriptures. But there are also ways that we tend to respond in these places that are challenging and dry and difficult in our lives. These seasons of, of, or experiences of wilderness, if, if we're not aware of how we tend to respond in these experiences, then we might miss what God's trying to do in us and the ways he can work in our lives. Uh, Put your hand up if you've ever dealt with a difficult situation in a stupid way before. All the people with two hands up, they're called parents. I don't know how many times I've tried to deal with a tantrum or a behavioural issue with my boys and afterwards just gone, what was I thinking? Why deal with it that way? That was just not helpful at all. At a deeper level though, there are challenges we face that we can respond to with, with what seems wise and, and reasonable and helpful, but the way we respond is actually destructive uh, in the scheme of things. Cain and Abel 
were Adam and Eve's oldest sons. And after God accepted, uh, before, the, before what we read today, you might remember, God accepted Abel's offering given in faith. Cain was uh, a bit bitter and jealous. Not something we'll go into today. But before the passage uh, we read, that we read, it, it also says that God warns Cain, right? Anger is in your heart. You've got to be aware of this. This is a risk for you. It's a threat that lies within, right? He says, God says, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now, at this point, we've, in the Bible, we're only three and a bit chapters in. We've read about Adam and Eve. The precedent's been set. Sin resulted in being cast out from the Garden of Eden. And it literally took them into the wilderness, if you like. And this is what sin does. It puts us in that barren and dangerous place, that threatening and scary place. Now, I'm not saying that a wilderness experience that you are facing right now or have faced is a direct result of something you did or didn't do and it ticked God off and so he kind of kicked you out and said, well, suffer. That's, that's not what I'm saying. But God is forming all of us into images of Jesus, into people becoming more like Jesus because we all have a sin disposition. For all of us, sin is crouching at the door, right? And it needs to be dealt with. That's what God said to Cain. Like, you need to rule over this. Uh, in Cain's case, as we read, his, his, his sin, what he did, he killed his brother, that did take him, direct, that direct act took him in further into the wilderness. It took him to become a wanderer in a dry land. But sometimes God takes us to the wilderness not because of a distinct wrongdoing right then and there. Well, you've got to be punished for that. Right, but because he wants to keep growing us, because we all have this, this sin crouching at our door. However, what we do in that place, when we're in the, when we're in the wilderness, what we do there is the key. So Cain's story is the first in the Bible where a human being is in the wilderness. It's after Adam and Eve's sin. But the choice that Cain makes is not to trust in God. Thankfully, there's other examples of those who did, but Cain didn't. And note that God's not absent. God's not nowhere to be seen. Well, sorry, I'm back in Eden and you're out there on your own now. God's talking to him. We can really easily confuse a wilderness experience with a, with a lack of God's presence. In reality, it's, it's the lack of the good things and the abundance that God can give. Think about um, when Moses was talking to God and, and Moses and the people are in the wilderness and God says, you can go to the promised land you can go to the place with abundance and provision and everything, but I'm not, I'm not going to go with you. And Moses wisely chooses what? He chooses to stay in the wilderness, but with God. Not to go to the place of abundance, but without God. So, so God is with us in the wilderness. It's not about, well, God's gone. That's what the wilderness is. God can be with us. Cain's not without God. He kills his brother, and then it says he leaves God's presence. But God never says, be gone from me, you wicked one, right? He'll be cursed, he'll face hardship, yes, but he's also marked by God for protection from others. What I want to highlight is what Cain chose to do in this wilderness that he now faced. It says he's now a restless wanderer. Right, that's the term used twice to describe it. a restless wanderer on the earth that will now, quote, bear no crops. He's a restless wanderer in this dry, barren land. This is what the wilderness experience, a wilderness season will do to us. It creates restlessness. It creates fear. And maybe the best word for this day and age would be that it creates anxiety. There's a lack of provision. Right? There's threats. The dryness, the wild, the lack, the, the darkness, the cold, the heat in a physical wilderness, right? So he's now anxious. He says, like, particularly he's anxious about whoever lurks around the corner ready to kill him because it's just every man for themselves out there. And that's what he's worried about. He says, God, someone's going to get me. And even though God says, it's okay, I'm going to protect you, I'll mark you, you'll be protected, Cain does something. He builds a protective 
stronghold. Cain was then building a city, and he named it after his son Enoch. Now, in those days, a little bit of cultural context, people, like there's not the, obviously the technology and everything, the establishments we have, uh, anyone traveling through the wilderness would be filled with hope by the sight of a stronghold. You're traveling and it's, it's dark and it's, it's dusty and it's, it's dangerous for a whole heap of reasons. And it's like, wow, there's a city. There's a stronghold because in that place, there is um, a, a peace of mind. That there's within the city walls that keeps out the threats. It's safety. It's refuge. It provides hope. And so this, this kind of idea of an of a ancient wanderer going through the wilderness, anxious about everything around them, and then seeing a city and going, oh, I just got to get there providing hope. This highlights something about us. When we are anxious about our circumstance, we seek out strongholds. When we can't find one, we build one. That's what I want to talk about today. One author calls strongholds humanity's oldest antidote to anxiety. A stronghold, it centralizes power and resource, right? It's people come together, and that can be very magnetic because it's like, well, I'll join that as well, and then there's more resource and more power and more people. It's a vision of hope. It's a home for the wandering, right? And these, these strongholds, these cities, they take on a life of their own as others are drawn to them. And our world, 21st century, is, is full of these places of refuge, these strongholds people can go to. Stable, secure, structures of power. Often that's institutions, right? It can even be the church or it might be an education system. It can be governments. It can be social networks. It can be online worlds created for a sense of security and identity for each person who joins it. They're places of refuge. But simul simultaneously, strongholds are designed to protect People from what? Other people who have a differing vision and a differing idea of who should be in power and what things should be like. And so strongholds eventually, because they're full of people, begin to splinter and fracture and crack. And then power begins to disperse because this stronghold is not so strong anymore. One example of this in history is when the Roman Empire fell. And now, in the dark, as you go into the Dark Ages, you have little castles that pop up all over the countryside. Smaller, but still not insubstantial, strongholds all over the place. And then the same thing happens, and power disperses and disperses. And this begin to, begins to illustrate how in eras like ours, individualism can be understood as a network of small strongholds of self. So rather than these big cities or big institutions where people go, if I'm just part of that, I'll be, uh, I can mitigate against the anxiety, it's little, the power is so dispersed that it's with the self. And now we have the stronghold of self. You're a stronghold, I'm a stronghold, we create strongholds ourselves. Now if you want to read more about this, I highly recommend um, Mark Sayer's book called A Non-Anxious Presence. He unpacks this in far more detail, probably unpacks it far better than I just have. But basically the point I want to make is this. In a world like ours, it's easy to do what Cain did. Cain was a restless wanderer. He faced the anxiety of being in the wilderness, and so he built something to protect him. But for us, it's not a literal city. It's whatever provides that inner freedom and that safety in our individualistic society. It's the job, the house, the net worth, the circle of influence. It's the image of success or the being the authentic self or whatever helps us feel like we're at peace. Whatever helps us feel like we can get rid of the anxiety. It can be drugs, alcohol, porn, binge watching, but those are, I think, are usually just a brick in the whole construction that we develop to keep us safe. Enoch the name of Cain's son that he named his city after means disciplined, trained, dedicated. Often it's our hard work, right? It's what we've strived for with our own hands. That's the stronghold that we've built. It's the stronghold of self. The self becomes a place of protection and power to get through life and its challenges. The problem with that, if you think about it, 
A city, a big, a big stronghold like, let's say, Jericho was one of them in the ancient world or one of those major cities. Or in our day, um, a big institution like Harvard or, or a government or, or, or whatever, you, you pick whatever the large, well-established uh, uh, place of power and of resource. These are well-positioned to guard the people within it from the anxieties that face us in the world. But when it comes down to individuals trying to protect themselves against the anxiety we face in the wilderness, do you see the problem? We're a lot more fragile. If we're trying to get through on our own, now that anxiety just comes full circle and I'm just anxious about all of the stuff that tries to come against me in the world again. And we now live in what I've heard a number of people from independent angles call an anxious age. That is, the, that is the world we live in now, an anxious age. And so, yes, our sinfulness uh, can lead us into the wilderness. The wilderness is a dangerous place. But if building protective strongholds of any kind isn't the answer to mitigate and disperse and dispel the anxiety that we face in our lives. What is the answer? Well, let me turn to the words of some of the prophets and the psalmists who say, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold, I shall not be shaken. That's Psalm 62. Psalm 144, my loving kindness and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer. And Nahum 1.7, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows those who take refuge in him. The Lord, our God, is meant to be our stronghold. Cain expressed his concern about the wilderness. They're going to come and kill me, God. These other people wandering around like me. And God said, okay, I'll protect you. I'll put my mark on you and no one will harm you. And then he still built the city. He was still worried about those lurking in the shadows, those external threats that might harm him. But the real issue for Cain was not those on the outside. It wasn't the external threats, was it? What was the real issue for Cain? It was the thing, quote, crouching at his door. It was that sin. It was what was inside, not what was external. And so if you would ask me, well, what does it look like to go to God as our stronghold? I'd say, in a word, repentance. Sarah preached my sermon already at the end of the worship this morning. (laughs) Repentance, repentance. This is what it's about. The wildernesses we face are to form us, to shape us, to humble us, to literally drive the sin out of us, or to become masters over it, to use the language God used with Cain. Building our own strongholds uh, is a result of this mindset. I want protection from the threats that are outside me, but I want to ignore the threats that lurk within me. And look, I, I... I'm like you, I don't want to reveal my heart to anyone. I don't want to be vulnerable. I don't want to be transparent. And so I, like you, create the illusion of a safe and secure place. I can find refuge. While the greatest cause of our anxiety lies within. For a child, what's the the safest and most secure and reassuring place to be for a young child? Right? Right? In, our, in, our, in the parents' arms. Right, Micah and Josiah naturally desire this of me. First thing in the morning, they've been asleep for eight or nine hours, and then they run in, and, you know, they've been apart from me. That's what they want, first thing, this, this hug. They also naturally desire this after they've done something wrong and guilt kicks in. Like, first it's the tantrum and you're horrible and ah, and then it's like I need comfort, I need reassurance when they realise their fault They need that embrace and they come for that. That's what we're trying to recreate with a stronghold, but without repentance. See, without turning from the self way and running to God, we we 
we don't actually deal with the internal problem. Cain was warned, sin is lurking, it's crouching at your door. He still messed up, but then he still dealt with it by running away, building his own place of protection, despite God saying, I will protect you. And I said last week that our deepest desire is not actually to achieve or to accomplish or become something. It's to hear, you are loved, you are my beloved. It's to know the love of our Heavenly Father. It's the tight embrace. And I don't know about the rest of you men. I know maybe you get a bit squirmish with this. Well, you know, uh, you know, it sounds lovey-dovey. No, no, no. What we each desire, men and women, is that tight embrace, those words of love and affirmation and affection spoken over us by our Heavenly Father. And a self-built stronghold can give the illusion of that. That's why we build them. That's why we build Enoch, disciplined, trained, dedicated. A stronghold we build can feel a little bit like that comforting embrace we long for, protecting us, holding us, but it can't speak those words, you are loved. It can't speak, you are my beloved, like our father can. These are the words that disperse and and, and disintegrate and dispel anxiety completely. The kind words of our Saviour. He is the stronghold who protects, guards, welcomes, gives hope, shelter, provision. We're going to sing a song called Jesus, Strong and Kind. If we, if we think of God only as strong, this, this stronghold, but forget that he is a kind, strong person, a loving one, then maybe we won't run to him. But he's strong and he's kind. That's who God is, our refuge and strength. In the end, these other strongholds that we build, whatever it is, whether it's just your own sense of security in your house or whether, I mean, I saw something, let me just pull it up, yesterday. Uh, um, unfortunately, I'm not going to have this on the screen, but I was on Facebook and there was an ad from Meta, which is what Facebook is now, and it's, I don't know if you can see this, right? Be your true self in the metaverse. Anyone know what the metaverse is? A fake reality. And I mean, this is the stuff of sci-fi movies, right? It's like, yeah, get into a fantasy land and be who you really are. No, 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 no. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. So whether that's the kind of, of place of security to, to get away from the anxiety or whether it's a, your house or whether it's money or finance or your job or a relationship, whatever it might be, the thing about these strongholds that we build, they are counterfeits. They're substitutes, counterfeits for the real presence and protection of God. And when they're tested, right, When anything comes against them to test whether they're really strong and can really protect us, we all know what happens, right? Yeah, that, that, I wish, yeah, a little bit more. Two kicks, all right? They just crumble. They just crumble, but God does not. So I was just thinking as we come to a close today, how, how do we make God our stronghold, our refuge, our place of shelter? And I could certainly, you know, leave us just with, you know, just, just run to God. Just, just go. I was thinking about the prodigal son and the older son, and it's just coming back to God, just letting go and coming back to God. But I think practically we need something that helps us visualize and understand what it means daily to come to God as our refuge and our strength every single day and not, some, not the self or things we could build ourselves. So... Um, Karen, did you want to help me with this or did you want me to pick someone else? Okay, so I'm going to get Karen up the front and, um, and we're going to have a little date night. Yeah, can we get, yeah, can we get a babysitter, please? That'd be that, for our date night. That'd be fantastic. So, um, so let's just imagine Karen and I, are, uh, um, we're having a, a dinner at a nice restaurant, right? And there's nice lighting here. Um, someone's poured our wine for us. Hi, darling. <laughs> Let's not be too romantic because we're illustrating something about God here. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but imagine, you know, having, having a dinner at a place where the lighting's really nice and it's such that um, there are other people in the restaurant. There's 
there's, a, there's other stuff going on. There are other people meeting together at other tables. But the lighting and the setting and the way the music's well balanced and everything is such that um, it means that everything else, all of you are peripheral. There's not sort of a, a distraction from everything else going on in the room. It means that this space right here, we're able to, two people, just focus and uh, um, interact with each other at a level that's deeper than just casual conversation, and we're not distracted by anything else. Now, from time to time, what happens when you go out to dinner, right? The waiter comes by, and the waiter, thank you, waiter Cam, <laughs> will say, you know... Can I get you anything? Uh, yeah, just, just tap water, thanks. Um, oh, actually, I think we'll have sparkling tonight, because it's free. <laughs> um, not paying anything. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, the waiter will come by to take our order. Um, a good waiter will come by, you know, later in the night and say, you know, how, how was your meal and take our plates. We'll say, thank you very much. It was nice. And, and they won't really butt in and kind of, you know, try to, you know, a conversation about the weather or anything like that because this is the, this is the space that they know uh, we are most engaging in. This is uh, Eugene Peterson uh, paints this picture um, in one of his books. Uh, this is a picture of prayer. Being able to just have a conversation with God, um, intentional, uh, everything else is peripheral. That's the main, the main point. When the lighting's right in a, in a, in a good restaurant, and it's not, you're not distracted by other things. It's just a, an intimate space right here. And afterwards, um, you know, Karen and I might, might go you know, out, um, outside after we've had, um, had a meal together and had this kind of intimate space. And we might meet up with some friends or something, and the conversation would continue casually um, out on the street, but um, not just not as uh, intimate and, and, and kind of focused as this is right now. And that's also a picture of pair. Sometimes we come out of that, that, that focused space um, and continue the conversation with God, but now not everything else is not quite as peripheral. But there is a... Eugene Peterson calls it a parody of prayer, kind of like a, a counterfeit of prayer. And that's where the person across the table from me is self and the waiter is God. And this is not real prayer because when the waiter is God and really I'm just consumed for the whole of this time together in self, and what's going on in my world and how I can build my world. And occasionally the waiter comes over and says, you know, can I help you? Or can I help you? Is there anything I can get you? Yeah. Oh, um, yes, I'll have the steak. Yeah. Yeah. The, occasionally the waiter comes over and, you know, you know, how can they help? And then maybe at the end of the day, thank you very much, where do I pay? You just, you know, and then we go over there and, and I might even tip the waiter, right? And say, thank you for the meal, that was very nice. But ultimately, that's not how our relationship with God and our, and our prayer is supposed to work, where God is just the waiter, who we engage occasionally. God is the person across the table from us, and everything else is peripheral. And I think that this is an image we can take away to go, how do we shift from being consumed in our own worlds and going to God as our stronghold? Make sure he's not just the waiter in our uh, time and our focus Make sure he's the person across the table from us. So, Father, I ask that this morning you would give us a resolve to have time with you each day, knowing that we have busy lives. There's many things we have to do. But time with you each day where everything else becomes peripheral. Everything else is out of focus, so to speak. And we're just conversing with you. So that when we leave that place to get on with uh, the busyness of our lives, that the conversation would continue and you would continue to be the most important person in our life and the one we go to whenever we need. Whatever we need in the wilderness. Father, I want to pray for those who are in a wilderness season right now. For those who are in a dry place or a barren place. Lord, I want to ask that whatever they have done, whatever they have constructed to try and 
um, navigate through that, that it has not been turning to you. Uh, whatever they've done, which is just a trying to protect themselves against the anxieties that we face in this world, I pray you'd forgive them for that and help them just to let go of that and instead turn to you. Lord, thank you for all of the tools and all of the things that you place in our lives to be able to navigate difficult times, all of the resources that you've given us. But Lord, ultimately you are our stronghold. You are our refuge and strength. So we choose to turn to you today, daily, weekly. Every time there's an opportunity.